In the last video, we were introduced to mob grazing, explored some definitions, and learned about what benefits and drawbacks farmers using the practice have seen. Here we'll take it a step further and learn how to implement mob grazing from those same farmers. We'll learn from their successes, as well as their mistakes, as they've slowly adapted this system to their own operations. Each farm uses mob grazing differently, but there are many commonalities as well, many of which will be instructive for any producer interested in experimenting with this intensive style of grazing. just seemed like it made a lot of sense. I didn't like the quick rotations, didn't seem like it was gonna work. Even some people we deal with in the southern United States, we finally got to start rotating some pastures versus just set stocking, you know, a larger area. Because we did traditional rotational grazing before that, and, and I think I've seen an increase in soil organic matter since we've done this. You know, we, we get a better job of pulsing, we're getting better uh, trampling. and I've had more success following the mop grazing than I have with the take half, leave half. ready to screw up. <laughs> I mean, what, what I tell everybody is when you're setting it up, do it as temporary, as cheap as you can, because tomorrow you're going to want to change it. People that are, you know, starting out, don't have a lot of uh, money, not buying a lot of land, don't have a lot of animals. So if, one of the first things I tell them is you can run high stock density with small number of animals. Uh, the other thing is a lot of times they're not buying good farmland. They've got really worn out, crappy land, right? And so one of the things I tell you, I say is uh, you can buy some old crappy hay. It's the cheapest hay you can find. And you buy a case of beer and you have your buddies come over and you roll that out. And a lot of times you're talking 10 acres, 20 acres maybe. And you can take an area of that and just cover that ground. You've got to get the litter and that'll jumpstart everything. So get some old hay that people are giving away or $5 a bale hay. Roll it out on there. That's a good start. Then once that comes in and down, you can put the animals on top of that and start pounding that into the ground. You know, you got litter and you got density going there. And take the first year to just let's start, let's graze, start grazing taller and let's start grazing intensive. Take your time and then, you know, you, you can make adjustments as you go. Well, we, we really like the New Zealand genetics. We do use Strictly Jersey the last probably six years and, you know, they're proven on grass and that's really what we are striving for. We're looking for that two-thirds body, one-third leg and we're looking for a big, lots of body capacity. So that's really, and we really like the jersey from the standpoint that we, you know, we do once a day milking from probably you know, six months of the year. And they work better with that system, I think, because of the higher solids. And it's just more efficient animal for the same pounds of feed, supposedly they produce more and they don't have as big a maintenance requirement. So I think for grazing, they make a lot of sense. Like a farm like this that was so run down, it, mob grazing would work wonderful and it probably should have been beef originally, that we could come into these farms and that applies whether it's a you know, typical dairy farm or just a, a cornfield. If we could come in, ideally, with beef herds, mob graze them for several years, then bring the dairy cows in. On, on our farm, we have a, a semi-mob grazing concept with our dairy cows and have for, for like a decade where we're grazing a lot of times at probably this high and we're leaving behind you know, 10, 12 inches at times. What has worked really well is where we ran the cows through in that process, let it regrow, and then come back with heifers or bulls, and then actually mob it down. You know, watch the condition on the animals so that, you know, if they're starting to lose condition, obviously they need a little bit more of a break and we need to feed more to the soil. Your Brian Post, the reels, uh, the geared reel, you definitely want to use a three to one reel. They actually have a, it's called a bat latch, which is a uh, solar powered automatic opener that uh, with a spring gate so that the cattle can move. We haven't done that. We made, I would definitely like to do that. Take a look at that. On this main part of the farm, we've got about 200 acres. I've got 10 big uh, uh, construction tire water tanks mm -hmm. uh, with cement underneath in the inside of them with floats there. And we poured cement on the inside of it. We uh, plumbed it up so you have a water flow pipe coming in and an overflow going out. We pipe down to a ditch or got it away from there. We put geotextile down. This is from an equip uh, grant from uh, NRCS. 
Uh, I think it's 24 foot square of geotextile, then eight inches of blasted rock, six inch, blasted six inch rock. Mm -hmm. I just purchased some land three or four years ago. And on that, I run a line up the middle and I put spigots every uh, quick uh, disconnect uh, couplers, every 100 feet or whatever it was. And then I took a five foot tractor tire, cut out the, the bead on the top side, uh, bought a steel plate, bolted it up underneath there and uh, put a float on so I have a water line coming in, water line uh, uh, drain going out, and a hook, and I got a little bit of a chain in the back of the four-wheeler. I hook, hook it up, move it up and down there so I don't have any permanent source. I just keep moving that along as I go. The water is the one place we do cheat at times. So while we move that back fence, we don't always move the water tank. So we may make a, you know, like a, a little bit of a laneway for a while, and then eventually we'll move the tank ahead. limit to the number of animals you could have in the spring when it's when it's everything's popping off and then you know you get in the middle of the summer it gets a little dry it gets warm it things drop way off and the main reason that I backed off now is just simply because we, we, we were so dry everything just kind of shut down so the growth is not there to, to be able to, to stock you know so the only way I could mob now would I'd, I'd have just had to pull the animals in put them somewhere and fed them hay now, I don't care about the density as much. I use as much density as I need to to get the litter on the ground. And at times of year, that means it's going to be kind of fairly low density. And there's times of year it's going to be high density. Everybody talked about should you graze harder in the spring or not. And I think if you're going to do the mob grazing, I think you got to start early and you got to graze some. You got to knock that grass back. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're going to be able to graze some of that in June and July that isn't cut it out. mob grazing it's a different type of mature it used to be the whole plant would be dead all the way down now we start coming in here and look and if you come up in here and look you can see all these new new clover down in here look at this there's all kinds of new clovers we've got new plants growing in here a little over here we got new trefoil shoots coming in and so there's a lot of really green growthy stuff down low that they're grabbing they don't have to be eating the tops of this you know the dead mature stuff that, what I hope is, the brown material is uh, trampled. That's our turns into organic matter. So grab the green material and, and utilize that. It doesn't bother me to have red clover blossoms showing, Timothy head starting to show, alfalfa is starting to blossom, uh, you know, when they're all still nice and green. The cows, I mean, that, that gives us a nice balance. But as you start to see that, you know, go further into the cycle, now we're, now we're going to start losing, losing ground. And I think this happened in Iowa with, with some different people. They mob grazing, they started talking about it, and we're going to try something different, we're going to do something. But they really didn't have the tonnage of forage there to mob graze. You know, you can't take a continuous pasture and the next year start mob grazing it because there's nothing there to mob graze, right? These cattle will rotate through 30 to 35 pastures, and so we, the goal, like I said, is to move them morning and night. And so it'll be, when you first come home in the spring, it'll take it'll take more than two weeks. I mean, if you did a simple math, it would be about that. But it'll take about three weeks probably the first time. So 20 to 25 days, somewhere in there. We had that regrowth period. From that first rotation, after we're here in Wisconsin about a month, the rotation goes from that half day, it'll be about a day. And so the next time, it'll be about 40 to 45 days. And so all of our pastures on a normal year will be grazed three times, a few of them. Maybe half will be grazed four times. And so you get that third rotation, it'll be more of a 60 to 65 day lag from grazing point you know, to grazing point. When we're uh, in full grazing mode, we're moving the cows four times a day. We move them to a paddock after milking in the morning. We give them the other half of that paddock or third of that paddock at noon. And then after milking at night, we give them a portion of a paddock and then at nine o'clock when at about dusk, then we also open up the rest of that paddock. We are grazing really high, uh, long rotations. We've been at about 51, 52, 53 days on our rotation. It varies just slightly. It's going to be in that 30, typically 30 to 40 day range. I mean, we go 50 days, 60 days at times. So, you know, there is there is no set amount. something or you, you change the intricacies of your, your operation and you figure out what works best for you. Sometimes I pick up the phone and say, hey, uh, I do something I'm interested in doing, you know, how's it work for you? And just, just ask people. They've been really, really helpful and really friendly. Oh, I definitely try it. It's 
especially if you're sense docking. I, you know, some people they just they like to put the cows out in the morning. They don't want to see them till night. And I guess that then mob grazing is probably not for you. <laughs> you have to change. You have to be flexible. You have to do what what the environment, what the weather, what Mother Nature tells you. You have to do. So you have to change. You can't just set something up and that's the way it's going to be. It's not going to work. And then spend a lot of time out there. Go out there every day, and and walk. Be with the animals. Go out there when they're not, just through it. Observe it. See it. You know. Then you you make your little adjustments, and that's how I do everything on this place. Every farm is different, and the ways in which mob grazing is implemented will be equally diverse. Hopefully, these producers' stories give more definition to a sometimes blurry picture of what mob grazing really is. And by learning everything you can about this practice, adopting it slowly, and continually observing all parts of your grazing system, you too may experience many of the benefits observed by these innovative farmers.